Hi, Dr. Greer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, Dr. Greer, it appears that you have some really amazing breaking news to share with people. Um, can you tell us what this is? I can, and I have to be circumspect, but uh, I'll be as direct as I am allowed to be. Um, the biggest development, uh, I think, in uh, getting the, the cover-up of the UFO issue changed has been happening in the last uh, month or so. And, um, you know, I'm working with some folks and have been in Washington, as you know, for a number of years. There's been a sea change. There's been a realization that um, these beyond black unacknowledged special access projects are in fact being run outside of supervision and, and constitutional oversight. And that's happening at a very high level in the US government. I'm here in Washington today. Of course, I leave to come out to um, Scottsdale tomorrow. And then our conference starts on Friday, April 8th. And there's been a change to the schedule because of this development. Um, so that on a Saturday at 2 p.m. during the initial part of my presentation uh, as 2 p.m. Pacific, those of you who want to join uh, the conference, of course, is already uh, sold out, oversold, whatever. Um, but you can join my webinar. The link is beh below in the right up here um, when you see the posting for this. Um, and the reason this is going to be very important, first, a little bit of background. Uh, many people, I think a few years back, two or three, four years ago, were shocked when the memo leaked about Admiral uh, Wilson, uh, Tom Wilson, who uh, I had briefed in, in back in the uh, late 90s. And I had said for a number of years after he retired and left that command, that even though he was the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he had been denied access and in fact had been threatened directly when he made inquiries into the ET and UFO related uh, unacknowledged special access projects. And the, an overview of those, the very good one is, is you can see it on Amazon Prime or Tubi, it's a big documentary called Unacknowledged. And it's had over 700 million people see it. And if you haven't seen it, you should see it as sort of background to what I'm about to tell you. Uh, I think at the time when that memo leaked uh, from uh, Dr. Davis, uh, the people, were shocked, even though I had already warned people that the folks that we had met with to provide information on the subject, such as the director of the CIA, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, members of Congress, uh, people in the White House, et cetera, uh, had in fact made directed inquiries and had been blocked at every turn. Now, most people think this cannot be the case, but it is. Now, it's taken a few years for since the last wave of um, disclosure attempts since the Unacknowledged movie came out uh, four or five years ago. And we just released today another one. It's not, it was not done by me, but I cooperated with it. It's called Above Top Secret, and I recommend people see it as soon as they can. It gives more background on this. But this particular a breakthrough in government investigation. Uh, while I cannot refer to what agency or group is, is doing this, uh, is the most serious one since 1945. And so in, in light of that, we've made some appeals for whistleblowers to come forward. As you know, in the 2001 press conference, uh, we had a couple dozen there, but we had over 100 we had already interviewed. Many of them are, are in various uh, sites. Our YouTube channel that you're on now, if you look through it, you'll see several dozen of them. One of the most significant and recent whistleblowers that contacted us a couple of weeks ago. And this man in the early 2000s, not very long ago, had been assigned to a retrieval team. Um, out of the Nellis range, the Nellis Air Force Base, so-called Area 51, but way north on the range at, at a remote base, uh, the drawings of which we have and we will be showing on Saturday at that 2 p.m. presentation. And he had been selected to be on this team basically to gather up debris or retrieve objects that had downed. 
And there were two types that he was involved with. The first were the man-made UFOs, the things that unfortunately 99% of ufologists and everyone in the U.S. Congress and White House think are alien, quote unquote. They're not. Um, and he saw that immediately. This was broad daylight. One, the first one was a, a downed or disabled one that had had some problem, totally electromagnetic, uh, roughly triangular. And we have the schematics and drawings of that um, from the whistleblower himself that have then been made into very accurate drawings by uh, Michael Schratt and his team. And we'll be showing those on Saturday. The other thing uh, that happened is that he was deployed to a couple other incidents like that. And then, the, of course, the, the, the major one was when an um, extraterrestrial vehicle, an interstellar craft, about 65 feet in diameter, and we'll show people the drawing of that as well, was somehow forced down way far north in the uh, Nevada test range, uh, way north of uh, uh, the actual uh, Nellis Air Force Base in, in, uh, in Nevada. And that craft, um, it was disabled, and above it was an uh, alien reproduction vehicles, as they've been called, or a man-made UFO hovering, holding it in check. Uh, now, there were a whole series of things that ensued, and uh, it, it, it ended quite spectacularly. I'll, I'll go into that on Saturday. But there were three ETs that came out of the craft. And two of them came over this particular whistleblower, touched him, and a whole series of events transpired. Uh, then when he realized that we, humans, were the problem, that we were targeting these objects, uh, and that these uh, people, these ET people, were completely non-hostile, um, very brilliant, communicated through thought forms and impressions and uh, like packets of information as we speak about, uh, he wanted to withdraw from the operation because he was horrified at what we were doing. Um, he was threatened with death. Luckily, he had a family member senior enough in the organization to shelter him and get him out and extracted him with 10 Marines, et cetera. But he was harassed. He was shot at, deliberately missed, obviously, just as a way of saying, keep your mouth shut. Um, now, two years later, He's back in his home state in the upper Midwest, and he is uh, broad daylight, 1.42 in the afternoon. A man-made alien reproduction vehicle, roughly triangular in shape, comes over his car stalls, and then outside the car are these three, quote, aliens. Now, these are the ones that everyone think of as aliens, not the actual ETs. And people go, what are you talking about? The vast predominant you know, experience people have had have been stagecraft by deeply black covert operations targeting humans, both who have had actual contact or people in government for their psychological compliance with their, the false narrative of there being an alien threat. And that happened to this man to the point that we have very clear drawings now of these PLFs. And also because he actually knocked one down and kicked it, the outer covering, it looks like skin came off and you can see the internal uh, uh, wires and tubes and what have you. So all of this we're going to go through on Saturday uh, and with the drawings and very specifically. Now, the reason that's so important is that this is not an uncommon occurrence. And of course, in Hollywood and movies and TV shows and UFO conferences, these are all presented as menacing aliens from outer space. And of course, I found out in 92, 93, 94, that in fact, we had highly classified projects that were manufacturing the fake aliens and that that phenomenon was, has, was launched, not just in the United States, but all over the world, to cover up the presence, it created a sort of distraction, a misdirect, of the actual ETs. Now, this is really important 
for the people in the CE5 contact community to understand because there's, there's, there's an endless number of people dealing with these conspiracy concepts of you know, the good aliens and the bad aliens and the bad aliens working with the secret government and this narrative and that narrative. And there have been people in bases seeing these little guys running around in military bases. But of course, the people observing that, those mil military people, didn't know that those were not indigenous, let's say from another planet, but were basically very advanced robotics that looked lifelike. Uh, but I mean, really advanced and nanomolecular, I mean, very sophisticated. We're not talking, you know, you know, a robot at GM putting a bolt on a car. Very, very convincingly looking like a living extraterrestrial. Now, this has been really hard uh, for, for me to say these things to the public because it's not popular. People have their belief systems based on their fear and then from that hatred. But it's very important that this is now coming out in, in some very good excruciating detail. And of course, this account, uh, and we have this whistleblower, military whistleblowers, credentials, information, et cetera, uh, that's being provided to the proper US government authorities um, down to the level of specifics, operational details, et cetera. Why? Because that's the only way these folks are going to get into the system is getting them that kind of actionable intelligence, as we call it. And that is really important. And I'm gonna make an appeal right here, right now, um, here in Washington, for there to be a small army of these type of courageous whistleblowers to come forward, men and women who've been on these projects. And by the way, on that retrieval team, uh, there was a Delta group involved, but and there were also just the people who were there just technically to get stuff and pick up the debris. Um, but there were women as well as men in that operation. Uh, and this was not that long ago. So we know that there are men and women uh, still in those projects and who have been in them recently. Uh, we have extended uh, protection to this man, uh, which we were able to do. and. Um, we are also working on some other strategies, but those I can't speak about right now. Uh, I will say that there's now a conduit, a mechanism for these sort of people to cooperate officially with people in the United States government that has never existed. Now, the reason I say that is that in prior attempts, let's say Project Blue Book in the 60s, that was a, uh, a sort of a storefront set up as a PR exercise. It was never intended to get to the truth and then inform the Congress, the president, or the American people. It was basically, again, a misdirect. The $22 million sent over to Bigelow Aerospace that uh, Senator Harry Reid and that General Herbert gave us uh, the, the detailed information on, that was set up as a way of absorbing that money and interest that was authorized by people in Congress and from the Pentagon. And that then was all trash. It resulted in, in nothing except, a, as the general said, a 40,000 foot snapshot, because uh, he was an army pilot originally. And there have been others. Um, and over the last few years, of course, it's all been in the news, the New York Times, 60 Minutes, about various uh, investigatory efforts. Now, now what's, what changed in the last, couple of months. It's huge. It's big. The people who have been trying to get to the bottom of this on the various agencies and places have now realized that there's no getting into it through the front door. What do I mean? If you try to get to this through the chain of command, it doesn't matter if you're the president, doesn't matter if you're the CIA director, doesn't matter if you're a senator, doesn't matter if you're a three or four star general, unless you have been read into these projects and you've been read into them because you're willing to go along with a criminal enterprise, an unconstitutional, unlawful, murderous, kidnapping cell, you're not gonna be told anything, nothing. So by definition, and of course we came to this assessment by 1993 and 94, that if you know about it, you are perforce someone who's been turned and as part of this corruption, and everyone else 
it doesn't matter what your rank is. It doesn't matter what your position is. I mean, this is the case when I have met with ministers of defense in Canada, United Kingdom, Australia. It doesn't matter what your rank is. I mean, your position in the traditional government, you're not going to be shown anything or told anything. You go out to the Lockheed Skunk Works, you'll be shown a bunch of antique planes, a bunch of old stuff that run on fossil fuels. Uh, I know this for a fact, which is what they told me. Now, what does that mean? It means that now they sort of have come to a traumatic, and it is traumatic. I, you know, I sometimes break up talking about the trauma of 1993, 94, finding out that in fact, this was all true. It was not some wild conspiracy theory. Although it's pilloried as that, of course, you know, I tell people, you ever heard of the mafia? There are consp criminal conspiracies. That's why there are all the conspiracy laws. But the way you defame something is called a conspiracy theory. These are facts. Everything I'm sharing with you are absolute, in court, provable facts. Now, what that means is, since the sort of curtain has been pulled away, this, this sort of titanium ceiling they couldn't get through. What we're doing now is putting together the most dispositive proof evidence and actionable details for everyone who is a, let's call them the white hats in the government who are really trying to solve this problem and fix this problem. Um, we need the help of the public. And I am making an appeal now, and I will go into more detail this weekend at the conference of why we need it and how it needs to be conveyed. So our website, SiriusDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure, all one word, .com, there is a contact bar and under that are witness or witnesses. If you are a direct firsthand or someone secondhand but have documentation of say your father or somebody who have been involved excuse me, in these unacknowledged special access projects, please contact us. You know, we keep things very confidential unless the person wants to be known publicly. Um, and of course, anyone at that level, you know, they sign uh, non-disclosure agreements, sometimes out 70 years, they say they'll give up their pensions that they, and one recently that we dealt with that literally signed something say that they could be terminated, killed if they spoke of it. Now, that's not happening to any of these guys. We, we, we have a system in place to protect them. Um, and I, I won't go into that any further, except that I extend what we have had under our protection and it was kept our team going it to anyone who reaches out and anyone who helps to get this uh, fascist covert group um, under control before we end up in a real debacle on this planet. Now, that is something that everyone can network because it's six degrees of separation, as the old saying goes. There are people that every person knows somebody who knows somebody who may know somebody who, in fact, dealt with this issue. And it may have been peripherally, it may have been for a short amount of time, or it may have been for a very prolonged amount of time, who are now ready to come out of the cold and come out of those shadows. And now more than ever, we have a mechanism to do that because that did not exist in the 90s with the Clinton administration because the president got intimidated and, and stood down with that inquiry. Um, it did not happen after him with Bush and Cheney. And of course, Cheney's been a key member of this committee running this, and he pretty much just sort of ran the intelligence shop for the Bush White House. And of course, Obama. Uh, was given some information on this, but did not want to pursue it for a number of reasons. Usually it has to do with uh, the fact that they can't get any straight answers and they're intimidated and ordered what to do. Um, in fact, we have a clip of Obama admitting as much, even though he was the president of the United States and the chief executive, who's supposed to have access to everything as commander in chief. But in reality, they do not. And that's what Jimmy Carter also has told us, President Carter in the past. So the only way around this sort of blockade is through the back door. People coming out through the back door into our system and then into the arms of the people trying to fix this problem. It takes courage, it takes diligence, 
it's an enormous undertaking and it needs to be global by the way this is not just pertaining to the united states you know these operations are are worldwide i'll remind you in our documentary that came out on july 4th of last year that we discovered that Jacques Vallée had a uh, top secret CIA document that specifically describes CIA abduction programs in Brazil and Argentina, where they would uh, abduct civilians and make it look like it was alien abductions for its, and I quote, psychological warfare purpose. And that's word for word what's in a 1953 document describing the psychological warfare value of how they could use the UFO subject to enrich the war machine and eventually do what Werner von Braun, uh, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, warned about on his deathbed to hoax an alien threat. So th all of these operations are extremely well-organized, well-funded, uh, remember that the federal budget, United States, five trillion or plus or minus, um, most of those are entitlements. The rest is the Pentagon. <laughs> and there's a little bit that's discretionary, not that much. The discretionary budget that the United States government in its totality has is dwarfed by an orders of magnitude by the resources of this group. The technologies that the U.S. government has, as, as Admiral Wilson said to us, the best thing I know about is a B-2 stealth bomber. And I have learned that there are aircraft under the control of this clandestine group that can do circles around my B-2 stealth bombers. And this is the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is to me personally, when I had Edgar Mitchell at the meeting with me at the Pentagon. So I think people need to understand that there is a great opportunity that's opened, a door has opened, and we all need to walk through it together. Uh, and the more that do it, the stronger that move will be. So that's my appeal. Now on Saturday, the 9th of April, I'll be going through this and go through all the, the uh, images of, of the actual ETs, the actual ET craft, the man-made craft, and the man-made aliens that are on the cover of almost every UFO book. And, <laughs> and movie and documentary and film in Hollywood, all right? Um, and, and this is, you know, the penetration of this disinformation, this sort of a hoaxed alien presence has been thorough in all walks of life. Um, and unfortunately, it, it, you know, I said this when I was in New York meeting with a bunch of people who supposed of the New York 100, sort of the really elite New York City, at a salon in, in a woman's home. And uh, the wife of the secretary general was there and some other people. And this woman said, I've read 26 books about alien abductions. And I said, yes, ma'am. You have just absorbed into your consciousness 26 times more rubbish than someone who's only read one book. Because those, not that necessarily everyone writing those books are part of some conspiracy, they're not. They're just parroting what the you know observable experiences are without knowing who's causing the experience and most people have never asked the question pat and this is what's really concerning is it ours man-made or is it something extraterrestrial most people don't even know to ask that question well every single case that happens you have to ask that question because the technologies are extraordinary that they have to as the word has been used in, in a document we have stagecraft these, these false interactions and abductions and mutilations with aliens. Now, you know, to what purpose? It's obvious, it's psychological warfare, it's conditioning the public, um, the media, through movies, uh, what have you, to assess that one or more of these extraterrestrial civilizations are hostile and a threat. And that's simply not true, but it sells well because people like the cowboys and Indians fight and they love conflict. And, and humans generally are, tend to be very addicted to conflict, hate. And this is why we have endless racism, endless ethnic war, endless battles. Um, and this is the, you know, the original sin of humanity, it, is not being able to see the oneness of all of us in all life. And then every time there's a difference, you know, then we take up arms. The difference is 
you know, if you had a club and hit someone in the head, not great. Now we have thermonuclear weapons and the secret government have weapons a thousand times more deadly than a thermonuclear weapon that they have uh, weaponized uh, by studying extraterrestrial technologies. So this is an existential threat to the earth is what we're talking about. And we have to avert it and we can, there's time. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. And so we can do it, but we're going to need everyone to help us. Um, this is a, a, a daunting undertaking. And I can tell you the people that I meet, meet with routinely and have over the years, they're traumatized by this, who are in senior government positions, because it's a type I, you know, I sort of think of it as disclosure PTSD. For most people at home listening, this is all very entertaining. But if you're in charge, like General Hughes, who was head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, just like the intelligence entity uh, for the military, like the CIA is civilian. Uh, and you you're being shoved aside and don't know any of this. And you're flying blind to a fog about ready to hit a mountain. It's, it's terrifying. And so we have to create the roadmap. And this is the other thing. We need people who have actionable information and intelligence on project code names, locations. Uh, corporations, you know, bases, uh, facilities on a base, the underground layouts of these bases, mm -hmm. on and on and on. So that's what we really need. And I'm hoping that we can, you know, get enough information quickly over the next few months so that there can be a substantial breakthrough. And so the worst of the plans of this a secret government uh, operation dealing with UFOs can be averted. So that's what we're doing. But I wanted to let everyone know that, that that's what we'll be going into some depth on on Saturday. Just wanted to do a quick update for people. So we'll have, we'll have a schedule change, but um, I'm hoping that we'll have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks come forward by releasing this one, this whistleblower's information. It's so rich and they're so special because it covers not only the man-made ones in detail. I mean, we're talking right there, retrieving it, every detail. Um, but also the ET craft, the ET beings, and the man-made aliens. And so that case, where it's a series of events that happened from someone who was on a specific retrieval team and not, you know, like Clifford Stone, God bless him, he passed away last year. He was on one in the 60s. But this is in the 2000s. This is fairly recent. So um, it's a huge breakthrough. And I hope people will join us on Saturday and uh, network with everyone you know about this message, message to bring more people forward um, to, to uh, tell the truth and have the courage uh, to do this for our country and for humanity and the world. Now, is this something that you afterwards are going to have for people um, who may not be able to attend or may not be there? Is this going to be somewhere where people can see this afterwards or hear about it? Yeah, so the whole webinar, I mean, you can click on, if you can't see it live, it will be uh, available immediately at, after it's live so that you can see it at your leisure. Because we realize that if you're in Australia, it may be two in the morning or whatever it is. Um, or, or something crazy, uh, or in, in, in Europe, you know, at 10 o'clock at night in Pacific time, you're already, you know, eight hours difference in Paris. So it's, it's wee hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. So we're going to anyone who signs up for that will be have access for, I think, a month or so to be able to see it the entire weekend, Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday out under the stars. And that's the last, last thing I want to mention. People should get the CE5 contact app and then join and practice it and join us out when we're out under the stars on Sunday night. But we're also going to do it inside on Friday and Saturday night, the 8th and 9th. But on the 10th of April, we're all going to have, we'll have a few hundred people out in the desert on Native American land that they've let us use. And we're going to do the whole CE5 process for at least four hours out under the stars. And I think that that is very powerful because it creates protection and higher consciousness. It shifts the world's way of thinking away from war towards universal peace right. and higher consciousness. And ultimately, 
that is the most powerful force. And if you combine right action and courageous action with higher consciousness and spirit, you know, what the Shambhala kingdom, I think they used to call it, uh, you know, a Shambhala warrior, uh, mm -hmm. not violent at all, but in consciousness and spirit. I think that's what we all need to aspire to. And I think that's what we're all going to be doing together out in the desert. And I hope folks can, can join us. I think it's going to be amazing, really. Yeah, amazing. it's going to be awesome. Hundreds well, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, Pat. And uh, I, I hope everyone can, can join us virtually uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, um, you know, if you can't make it through the weekend, uh, you can just join us also just on Sunday night. So the link will, will, will guide you how to do that. Uh, and hopefully we want to have another one of these events. We hope in this year, maybe two more, uh, hopefully where we can hold more people than, than this particular site. Um, so again, thank you all and keep looking up. Thank you, Dr. Greer. Thank you for this wonderful information. Very explosive. Thank you. You're welcome.